Hoi hoi, hello and welcome to the Meet Maastricht podcast. I'm Katrina and together with our resident local Lucy, we will be exploring some of the amazing stories that make Maastricht so special. So sit back, relax and join us as we learn about our favourite Dutch city. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 12 of the Meet Maastricht podcast. Uh, Today, the day that we are recording this, is Ascension Day. So uh, by the time you're hearing this, it will be passed. But if you want some more information, we will be doing a post on Facebook this evening. Uh, I am here with Lucy, as always. Uh, how are you, Lucy? Well, bright and chirpy. Not, not, not really, <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, because, yeah, we, we haven't done this in the morning before, have we, Katrina? And I'm just not, I'm just not generally all bright and chirpy. No, we're both noon. we're both <laughs> night people. It's <laughs> we have to say. <laughs> Very much. Absolute absolute night owls. Yes. Yes. Uh, so what are we talking about this episode? We uh, we are talking about the Hof van Tilly. And Hof can mean garden uh, mm. and it can mean court. And in this case it's a court. We are talking about um, for most of the period, uh, this this site has existed, a very grand mansion. It's the it's a mm-hmm. type of building that in uh, in French is called a hotel. Okay. And then not yeah not a hotel as in a place a commercial institution where you go and rent a room to spend the night, but uh, living quarters. And uh, so that and and not not a castle in the countryside. But the city equivalent of something like that, and okay. a more a, more a palace than a castle. So these are these are the abodes of the grand people, and uh, so so uh, uh, families of nobility, and uh, they would they would have they would have residences in town, often connected to positions in society. They would have. So yeah, they might be they might be the uh, the commanding general of the the garrison of the fortification of Maastricht, which mm-hmm. of course was a was a pretty major thing for centuries on end. And uh, we have seen a hotel like in this sense uh, when we talked about the general's house on the Vreethof. Okay. That was a, that was the same the same type of building with the same type of function and the uh, and the whole van Tilly also housed the uh, general of the garrison for a while ah. so i mean i think the most obvious question is who was tilly <laughs> yes that well a, a, a nobleman okay <laughs> it comes from um, the first uh, nobleman uh, man in this in this uh, case who uh, owned this uh, mansion and also actually lived in it. And his name was Claude Etzerklaas, and he was Count of Tilly. And he was married to a countess, and her last name was Aspremont Reckheim, or Reckheim, which is the present-day Reckheim, just across the Maas River in Belgium. So of course this was uh, th- this was a, a very uh, powerful uh, connection of noble houses, but it's the the, the name Tilly stuck to the place. Mm. So they were, but they weren't the first family who lived there. No. Like it, it wasn't always the the Hof von no. Tilly. <laughs> no, exactly. Where did it start? The the court. Well, uh, it it started as a as a collection of uh, smaller houses. Okay. Uh, just outside the city gate in the first wall, so more or less where today there is the uh, the cafe Paulus across from the Hof van Tilly, there was uh, a city gate plus tower. Okay. And that is that is that is why the street name there is still Tweebergen Poort, which means gate. Okay. 
So in the first city hall of 1229, this was one of the places where you could go, uh, where you could go into the city or come out of it. But uh, of course, in the in the century after the first world, uh, the first wall, people already started constructing their second wall much mm. further out. But this first wall and most of its towers uh, stood for decades and centuries so and you can you can still find fragments of that here and there and everywhere so the first uh, houses on this spot were built just outside this wall and we're talking about we're talking about the the, uh, the 13th 14th century then and um, the houses on this particular spot were used as a refuge for one of the convents outside the city, I mean, we've talked of this before. That mm -hmm. that within the within the, the the safety of city walls, many uh, a monastic order would have a refuge, would have safe houses to come and live when uh, armies were once again plundering the land and laying siege to the cities. And, right. uh, yeah. So sometimes they were also absolutely not safe within the city. Re remember the story of the of the nuns convent of the Bayath that j that got bombed out and in yeah. that in that same in that same bombardment the Hof van Tilly was uh, damaged as well. But anyway, so that those were the first buildings in that spot. A refuge house for um, a ladies order who were in what is today Belgium okay. and this was a, this was a very posh order <laughs> uh, at least at least in the in the 16th century it was mm. uh, because the the ladies who were who were buying uh, the grounds then were of the very distinguished family of the Merode so that's uh, you know that's that's nobility and and the surrounding houses uh, were lived in by working people of of all kinds. So the the very mm. very uh, totally uneducated or who would who would be uh, called in um, yes beautiful Latin portitor sacorum. This would be someone who would be loving sex around. Oh, yes, it sounds better in Latin, <laughs> doesn't it? Though? <laughs> yeah, very hard work, though. And there, and there would be uh, people who would uh, who would have crafts or would have shops or, or workspaces or something like that. And then and then in the middle of this, uh, in in the middle of the 16th century, these uh, these ladies of noble families buy uh, a piece of land and uh, to to use it as a, a refuge. Hmm. And it's it is also around this time that uh, that the rest of the neighborhood starts deteriorating, and these posh nuns are complaining about that. And it is it is along the lines of these noble families that the that the uh, the grounds come into the hands of Tilly, okay, and uh, of the Count of Tilly, uh, and he buys additional space, and then he builds this grand mansion. Yeah. So did he flatten the the buildings that were already there, or build around them? Yes. Or, yeah. Okay. No. No. It is uh, uh, every, everything that was there was uh, was destroyed, and it, and a new building was uh, was constructed. Okay. And so, when was that? In the sixteenth century? Um. No. The end of the seventeenth. Okay. Sixteen hundreds. <laughs> Uh, yes, yes, the late sixteen hundreds. I'm 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 casting about here for an actual date, but. Um, Yes, very. It's around the turn of the century. Okay. So around around the year seventeen hundred. Okay. So that's when the count built the building that was, is and that's the building that's there now. Yeah. Sort well, of. <laughs> <laughs> the way history goes, it was it was conceived and 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 built as a as a. Uh, grand ensemble as these houses would be so um, uh, three segments uh, around a court in a U shape and with a beautiful entrance gate on the street which is still there although it has been not not left untouched in the in the in the centuries of it of its existence and then uh, on both sides there would be uh, on both sides of the gate, there would be along the street 
large buildings housing the coaches and the horses and, oh. you know those those people have their own transport in their house so to speak. <laughs> yeah just like the like a garage just yes yeah <laughs> but with yeah, horses except, instead <laughs> <laughs> yeah except bigger yeah. <laughs> and then in the in the u shaped building so the actual mansion there would be there would be a, a large reception hall, a salon, and there would be beautiful living quarters and there would be spacious room under the roofs where the servants could live. Mm. And behind this U-shaped building, to, all, the way, all the way to Hoog Frankrijk, there was a there was a, a lush garden and it was that was designed in the in the classical style of the age. So shorn hedges and uh, straight paths and a geometric mm -hmm. design. A beautiful, beautiful garden. And behind that there was an there was an orchard. So that is, you know, that's a meadow with trees. I'm not sure if they would have been fruit trees, but I suppose they uh, they might have been. Yeah. So it was a so it was a yeah, a, a, a grand mansion, you know, the the, mm. the urban variety of a land of the state. Yeah. And there were there were there were quite a few of those in the city because you know be, between uh, the first city wall of 1229 and the second city wall of a century later there was lots and lots of open space as we've yeah. mentioned before when talking about the convents well when that applies to the convents it also applies to the grand mansions and it also applies to the farms there were farms within the walls. Mm. which, of course, was also handy in times of siege. Yeah. Uh, anyway. No, I was just going to ask, um, so the Count, did it, do we know what he did? Was he just, I don't know, if you're a Count, do you just sort of be a Count? Or did he have a, uh industry that he was a part of? Well, these these life stories differ uh, enormously. They, yeah. they depend on they depend on the, the lineage you're from so uh, is it a family of good standing or not it uh, depends on the personality uh, no but the, the, the second thing connected to the lineage is um, if you're the first born mm -hmm. and then generally the first born male yeah uh, the, re the responsibility for the estate and for all the possessions will fall to you yeah. and the younger siblings will have to make a career for themselves uh, any which uh. way and of course because of the networks you know this is why uh, marriages were arranged and yes. why wills were so important of course people would be you know these are the original oligarchs so how to so to speak these is the, 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 of course they would they would try to control as much power and position as they could hmm. and and make arrangements uh, so that that would be the case and they would choose their careers uh, accordingly whether in the church or in the military or in the civil administration and of course this also depends enormously on the vagaries of the time yeah because the the period we are entering into now the 18th century, the 18th century, and especially the end of that, there were there were a few massive sieges of Maastricht by by the French king and then the French revolutionaries, mm. and uh, the entire societal order was turned upside down by the French Revolution and Maastricht being occupied and annexed by the French. Yeah, and of course, if you're of noble birth in a period like that, you have got a problem. Because most of them lost, most of them, quite a few of them lost their heads. Yeah. So yeah. members of these families were also fleeing mm. to all corners of Europe to escape this fate. And of course, all their possessions, like those of the church, were annexed. Mm. So was the the family uh, Van Tilly, were they still in that building when that happened? No. 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 No, and it is we we we've come across this type of story before. These these French revolu this French revolutionary administration annexed all the all the real estate and all the uh, the possessions of both the church and the nobility, and then tried to make a profit on that and didn't you know by selling it all and didn't succeed so very well so mm. uh, we, we've come across this before where, where where convents managed to get their original property back yeah and where and but in this particular case this this uh, noble family 
did not return to the city and the, and the, the, the grand mansion changed hands several times uh, from one civilian to the next. Mm. Although it has been uh, the first the first new inhabitant after the uh, the family of Tilly was also the commander of the garrison mm. but this was the this was the French revolutionary garrison oh. and these were yeah, these were not nobility these mm. were you know the French working class yeah, well, that's sort of the point, isn't it? Of the yeah, <laughs> French yes, Revolution. Yes, exactly. Yes, that was the whole point. Yeah. So, so there, there are these, there are these deeds in the archives that that show that the that the wife of this of this commander couldn't read or write. Yeah. Yeah, these were the common people, and they were they were occupying these spaces now, and mm. and uh, you know for for a while tried in all sorts of devious ways to to pay for the upkeep, and and then there were mm. there was a, a series of shady deals, and but it remained in the hands of civilians for for, for after that for quite some time. Yeah. And uh, one of the, one of them was local who managed to. Uh, to survive all these trials and tribulations of the time and uh, keep his standing from one administration so so the uh, in Maastricht the the medieval one you know the one connected to Leuk and mm -hmm. Ramon yeah uh, or uh, at this at this stage we are uh, landed in the, the royal houses of Austria but never mind that you know the two lords of Maastricht remember yes and then, and then when all of that fell apart, he managed to make a career in the new revolutionary uh, French province wow. that Maastricht was part of, and um, even even uh, managed to uh, have posts in uh, imperial palace, Paris. Wow! Because of course the French Revolution ended with an emperor. You know, it's. Yeah. So that, so they are very very turbulent times. Yeah. And, was yeah. that was that common for someone to be able to survive and maintain their standing? No. Throughout that, no. Yeah. No. This is this is really this must have taken a very a very sharp wit. And yeah. A very, very particular person. Yeah. Yes. A very agile personality and, uh, but I suppose also a great talent because mm. why. Why else would succeeding administrations find a use for him? Yeah, yeah. Or he made he made himself sort of indispensable, obviously, in in one way or another. But he yeah. was, you know, he was he he was not of noble descent. That must yeah. have helped him. Yeah. Uh, in the revolutionary times, and by the time the revolutionary times had had uh, uh, evolved into the imperial times, he had mm. proven his worth. So yeah. uh, I suppose. And and also, you know, uh, greedy as hell because you know he'd be, he'd been buying all this confiscated stuff at <laughs> at, at rock at rock bottom prices. Yeah. Uh, so he lived in the Hof van Tilly for. Yeah. He, he, yeah. he bought it. He bought it, yeah, and yeah. he practically he practically did not live there. So that this is this is very uh, this is behavior that is very typical of the. Of the uh, noble predecessors he had, these mm. people would have so much real estate, and they would have responsibilities here, there, and everywhere. Yeah. And usually, the often till he would be rented out. So you know that didn't help the the state of the building, as you can imagine. Yeah. And that that really got worse and worse and worse until in the about the middle of the 19th century, it changed function altogether. Because by now, Maastricht, bear with me here, and these are tumultuous times, as I said, by now, the city of Maastricht uh, was part of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, yeah. the Kingdom of the Low Countries. This was installed in 1815, and then in 1830, the South rose in revolt. Okay. And when it was, when it was clear that uh, Maastricht was going to be retained in the hands of the king in the north, quite a few well-to-do Maastricht families left the city because they weren't they weren't going to live under the rule of uh, this this king from the north. Yeah. So they so they went to Leuk and Brussels and um, so what became Belgium. Okay. And then this uh, <coughs> this uh, building, the Hof van Tilly, was put to use as a state school. 
Okay. Because this is this is one of the things that uh, that William the first, so the first king of the Netherlands, the first Dutch king of the Netherlands, uh, invested in or tried to promote. That was edu educating the people. Yeah. Because up to up to that time it had been haphazard and here or there and a little bit and only for the rich. You know, we've talked of this before. But it is it is in in the in the early decades of the 19th century that it is beginning to be considered a state responsibility to take care of education. Mm, yeah. So that's sort of the beginning of public education. Exactly. Yes, exactly. And uh, of course mainly for boys. Yeah, but in these in these public schools, there there had been uh, there have been provisions for girls right from the beginning as well. Yeah. So they um, the, this public education started in in uh, some houses in the city that they quickly outgrew. Mm. Well, the 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 Hof van Tilly was pretty much uh, vacated and dilapidated at the time, mm. and. Uh, Around the 1830s, it was uh, it was decided that uh, the building was going to be handed over to uh, be a public school, and then it was uh, restored and, and refurbished to work as a school. But uh, yeah, mm. it's just, this is also a recurring theme in all the stories that we've talked about so far. Uh, it is always uh, penny pinching and budget cutting and that stuff. Yeah. So because because now it belongs to the university. Uh, did it go yeah. from school to university building smoothly, no. or was it something in between? No, no, no. <laughs> it was no, of course not. <laughs> Silly what question. Do <laughs> what do you mean smoothly? No, of course not. It uh, it served for most of the uh, of the nineteenth and a good part of the twentieth century as professional training for teachers. Ah. So still education. Yeah, education. Yes. Yeah. And it and it uh, the funny thing here is because we tend not to realize this is that is that uh, the age group being taught to be teachers mm. were, were teenagers. Yeah. So this this school was was mainly uh, for boys from 14 to 18. Wow. And this being a public school, of course it was accessible to boys from all over. The Kingdom of the Netherlands. So there were uh, lots of young guys coming from other parts of the country, yeah. and they must have been culture shocked for the four years they were here because life here, the people, the traditions, the the city, the lifestyle, everything was different from what they were used to. Yeah. And as and as far as social status is concerned. Most of these guys were lower class. Yeah. So they were uh, at the beginning of the 19th century. The the profession of being a teacher uh, held no social standing at all, and mm. they were paid accordingly, or because they were paid so badly, they had no social standing. Yeah. You know what is yeah. what is the chicken and the egg here? Mm. But um, the the remuneration was improved. And the the requirements of standards were improved, and this improved the social standing of the profession. But it was still for the lower classes, for the bright guys from the villages and from the countryside. This was a way up the social ladder. Yeah. And this is this is completely in contrast with the situation for the girls, because the public school had a girls' department from the beginning. Mm. And this was populated mainly by girls from Maastricht, mm -hmm. but it seems that it was mostly used as as a as a uh, way for the Maastricht families to have their daughters out of the way and doing something vaguely sensible, but not with the intention of the girls becoming teachers. Okay, so they, were they taught something different then? Uh, in, to to some extent, when the yeah. when the boys were having algebra, the girls were taught how to uh, sew and do okay. the work. Yeah. But for the rest, the curriculum was the same because they were also they were supposed to become teachers and they didn't ah. mostly. Okay. And 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 they were and they were mostly middle class. So mm. you know th this is this is what I said before. This was this was 
a way for families to have their daughters not be yeah. unedu uneducated and uh, unoccupied until they could be married off. Mm. I don't know, this might not be a question you can answer, but it would be interesting to see if there were many middle class Maastricht girls who uh, ended up with or wanted to be with the more lower class non Maastricht boys who were both attending the school. <laughs> and if they uh, if they did much mixing, no, 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 because they weren't. No, because especially we get we're getting into the Victorian period now. Yeah. So you know, uh, uh, pathological prudishness, mm. and and also in the layout of the building, it was um, because the headmaster was very concerned that uh, he he would not get enough boy students. Mm. Uh, because there would be girls in the same building, and <laughs> so the bu the building was constructed in mm. no because before it had been co-ed. Yeah. Before before the Victorian prudishness uh, um, reared yeah. its <laughs> its ugly head, it was it was co-ed. But th of course they couldn't do that towards the end of the of the nineteenth century, and the girls were sort of segregated on a particular floor in one wing of the building mm. with a separate entrance. So okay. the boy the boys were in other parts of the building and they knew the girls were there, but mm -hmm. the, you know, that was the that was the ladies' quarters and yeah. you know, they didn't go there and they didn't mingle. Mm. I'm not convinced there wasn't some googly eyes going on yeah, once or twice. Of course there were of course <laughs> there were. Of course there were. There's there there is a document in the archives that 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 lists the the transgressions and the punishments <laughs> for the transgressions of the boys and I'm 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 looking for the text here, transgressions here, the, what is noted down that uh, pupil X and pupil Y have smiled to a few girls, <laughs> and here, uh, pupil uh, uh, W has taken a walk with uh, oh. lady such and so outside <laughs> the gate which apparently is even worse than inside the gate yes because other people might see lucy <laughs> other people <laughs> might see them <laughs> yes and there's there's also a mention of, uh, a mention of uh, one of them coming home drunk and oh. um, yeah emptying his stomach and uh, <laughs> wetting wetting the bed and oh, then when he gets reproached by the others, he pulls a knife. Oh God! I oh, mean, dear. it might. Not... It's escalated quite quickly from smiling at a girl to, <laughs> to pulling a knife. <laughs> but you know, you uh, try and try and imagine the disorientation of these of these kids. You know, yeah. fourteen to eighteen, and of course, people were supposed to, you know, grow up a lot faster. Yeah. In in earlier centuries than than uh, you know the, the the coddled kids we have today, but but still you know this is just this is just rough. They, mm -hmm. You know they, you, you come you come from a farm in Friesland somewhere you know with the with the grand open skies and the endless fields and you know the the Calvinist very very strict Protestant way of looking at life and then mm. you land yourself in a city like Maastricht <laughs> they must have been shocked out of their minds and well and they were and yeah. then of course teenagers being teenagers never mind the historical period you know this uh, come on this is nothing out of the ordinary is it <laughs> so it, no. must, it must have been, it must have been hard on them yeah yeah anyway into the 20th century mm. of course uh, <laughs> The first decades of the of the twentieth century, it got increasingly hard to be a teaching academy because now, uh, to the usual difficulties, was added that the Roman Catholic Church had expressly forbidden Catholic boys to attend this school. Okay. I mean, there were there, there were not many there to begin with, but still, so that 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 made it that made it everything that was being bad already made it worse because of yeah. course the, you know the, the the great economic crisis of the 1920s and 30s and then in the sec during the second world war first german troops and then american troops they just basically take the building apart okay you know it, everything that could take it out including uh, banisters and oh, electrical goodness. wiring everything was just taken out so the, yeah. the it was a mess but in the 50s and 60s, after the Second World War, of course, there there is a there is an increasing, a steeply increasing demand for teachers, 
and yeah. they try and fix up the building to such an extent that it can be used in a respectable manner, you know, efficiently and, and mm. uh, practically for uh, as a teaching academy. By now, of course, the teaching academy is for the age group above 18. People will first have had yeah. to finish successfully uh, secondary school. So they will they will have they will have to present a yeah. secondary school diploma and then they can get into the regs babu which which is uh, babu is regs is means of the state and babu is mm -hmm. um, how do you call that it's the first letters of pedagogische academie voor het basisonderwijs so an academy for elementary education so it, it teaches okay. it teaches academy for the 18 plus so when people graduate from uh, an academy like that, they will be 22, 24, you know, so around there. Yeah. And that, uh, and of course, that is that, that seems to be a more appropriate age to uh, to <laughs> teach kids, small kids. Yeah. yeah. And was it people from uh, from Maastricht, or I can uh, I can imagine that it might have been people from different places as well coming to the city to be educated or. I, I am supposing that the that the student population of the Pabu would have been mostly from this mm. city and this region because okay. it it didn't really matter anymore. Yeah, and so after it was the teaching college, yeah. um, when when did it become part <laughs> of the university? It's qu quite recently. It was. Uh, I, th I think oh. the. I think the university only acquired it in in uh, ninety eight. And yes, and okay. then and then of course uh, uh, it wasn't. It wasn't uh, of course because when it was uh, restored and uh, refurbished to be the teaching academy, of course it was. It was structurally mm. in in good shape again. But uh, but there was all the same. There was a there was a big overhaul of uh, the building, as as the university has done with with most of the of the inner city buildings that it uh, that it acquired, and some of the historical elements were brought back. Mm. And it is it is it is in good shape now. It is, uh, but but yeah. that ha that has been only for the past fifteen years that the university has been using it. So that, this is where the faculty of art and the social sciences is housed. Okay, I think that I think that concludes uh, most of what I could be talking about when the Hof van Tilly is concerned. So it's a it's yeah. a it's a lively uh, student hub now. Yeah, and it's quite it's nice that the university did buy it, and it is still filled with students yes. and education, yes. and it sort of has a long history yeah. of that. Um, yeah. I mean, after it was. <laughs> the home of many yeah. people yeah it's nice that that's a still a sort of tradition mm -hmm. that's being continued yeah. uh that appeals to my yes. <laughs> to my sensibilities yeah, mine too. yeah. I, I i appreciate that as well yeah yeah and uh do we know what we're going to be talking about yeah next of course week? i'm <laughs> i'm i'm, <laughs> I'm uh, shuffling about my stack of uh, maastricht silhouette no, of course, I have a, I have a, a, a pre-selection made. What we're going to talk about next uh, time is a building that, um, and also uh, uh, another civilian building, uh, which is which is only partly accessible to the public, in spite of the fact that everybody mm. knows it. It's the uh, it's the <laughs> Mommers on the Vrijthof, uh, and uh, yes. it is it is a it is a, it is a grand yeah uh, burger. So, so uh, a, a civilian building, but it, but it has mm -hmm. a very, it has a very particular history and connected to carnival. Yeah, yeah. that's that's how I yeah, know about exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> so this is this is a weird time of the year to talk about to talk about the Mormons, but you know we have no idea if we're still doing podcasts next year <laughs> around carnival, and I just want to get it in because it's. Uh, I think yeah. I think it's an entertaining tale of very very much the the light-hearted side of Maastricht. You can't talk about this city and leave out Carnival. So no. <laughs> well, I'm sure we'll look forward to that. I'm very excited to learn more about the uh, the building, which I know I know exactly where mm -hmm. that one is. So I'm feeling very pleased yes. myself. Shall we shall we give a shall we give a hint to the listeners? You have to yeah yeah. It is it is in the in the row of 
<coughs> excuse me, it is in the row of cafes on the Vrijdhof. So you stand with your back to the churches and you look at the row of cafes and then you have to look for a fool's head. Mm. Yeah. Well, if, you, if anyone finds oh. it and uh, take a picture <laughs> and tag us on social media, <laughs> we'll uh, see if we, if we can get some <laughs> people hunting for the moments. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today and don't forget to follow us on social media. You can find us on Facebook by searching Meet Maastricht and on Instagram at at meet underscore Maastricht. If you would like to learn more about us, you can also visit our website at meetmaastricht.eu where you can buy tickets and subscribe to our monthly newsletter so you're always up to date. Thanks again and tune in next time to learn more about our beautiful city. Tot ziens.